This is Get Real with Deb Waterbury, a show where Dr. Deb gets real as she teaches through books and studies on topics relevant for today. And now, here is your host, Dr. Deb Waterbury. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to our series on six pairs of sandals. And so this is the book that we're using. This is a book I wrote, I don't know, a few years ago. And I wrote it in response to the need I saw in our local churches and in all of our communities of believers, but especially in our local churches for women in particular to begin ministering to women. I believe men ought to be ministering to men. I do think that we get ministered to get two together. But there's a certain intimacy and a certain way that women can minister to each other that um, that is a a little bit more profound and easier to understand often than when we're in a mixed group. But the problem is we have a lot of women who are feeling themselves be inadequate and can't do these kinds of ministering things. And And I think that's just a big lie straight from the enemy because he wants you to think you're not good enough or that you don't have the things necessary to be able to step into these. So what I did in six pairs of sandals is I found six women in the Bible that I think exemplify six really broad categories of ministering and then show you what each of these women have, five different characteristics that make them good in that area. We've talked about uh, Deborah being the women's ministry leader, and then we've talked about Lydia being the small group leader, and then we have four more we're going to talk about, and then showing you then talking about how maybe you, what that application would be for you to step into this. What I'm praying is that by the end of this, you will see in yourself at least one of these. You probably have more than one. And then praying to the Lord about how you can step out and begin ministering to the women in your church or in your community. So today, what I want to talk about, who I want to talk about is Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, I believe, and I I think you'll agree with me, was a great a representative for being a mentor. Now, you know, that's a, that's a scary word, uh, being mentor. And it's a word that we use often when we're going to have someone who's going to help us maybe through life or through a situation. And I don't necessarily think that mentor is the best word to always use. It's just the word I think we go to. But as I talk about what it takes to be a mentor, I, I pray that you'll see you don't have to have, you know, some a whole grasp on life because I think that's what we think is how can I mentor somebody when I haven't got my own life figured out? Well, if you get your own life figured out, you're going to be in heaven. So you're not going to be able to mentor anybody there anyway. <laughs> so it doesn't take perfection. What it takes is a few characteristics that you may not have necessarily realized was really all it takes to be a mentor. You know, what I have, I have so many women coming to me these days. A lot of them are younger women who want someone to mentor them or just women who have gone through a tough time in their life and they're looking for a mentor. And the problem is, is we've got all these people over here who want mentors or feel that they need them. And I got, there are very few women who will, are willing to step into that and mentor. And you know, the Bible's really clear about older women mentoring and leading the younger women. And you understand that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with age. That has to do some, you know, often it's with age because with age comes experience, but most often it's really spiritual maturity and and having gone through things would allow you to mentor another woman. So what I hear from women is I got no, you know, these young women, I got nobody to mentor me. Then I hear a lot of old women say, what are we going to do with all these young people today? They're not listening to anybody. They won't do anything. They won't do what we say. Well, that's just not true. The truth is we have a whole lot of women who need someone else to come alongside of them. And perhaps that's a better explanation is that it's, it's your willingness to come alongside of another woman and then just talk with her and counsel her and be there for her. So I, I think Elizabeth obviously is just one of the best examples of being a godly mentor that we have in the Bible. So I want to talk about five characteristics that Elizabeth had that I believe made her qualified to mentor Mary. And then again, talk about how you can apply those and possibly then you could step into mentoring. You know, I had a mentor. I have a mentor. I am a mentor. We all, I believe, after a certain period of experience in the body should be mentoring someone. And again, that word sounds like it's such a category. It really is just coming alongside of someone else. So the first thing I think that that made Elizabeth in the situation where she could do this was that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, once Mary got to the village in Judah where where, um, Elizabeth lived, they greeted one another immediately, um, which would have basically meant that they sat down to exchange conversation about what's been going on, about their health, family, stuff like that. 
So it's during that conversation that we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby left in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, understand that is no small statement here. Um, because it, the Holy Spirit had not come down yet, you know, where we, we take that for granted now because Jesus, you know, when he allowed that to happen after he was resurrected and ascended and the Holy Spirit came down and fell on the, on the disciples, the apostles, well, this had not happened yet. So saying that she was filled with the Holy Spirit, not a small statement. So basically what Mary was telling Elizabeth, she told her everything that had happened to her. And, and Elizabeth was a woman of significance. Her, her husband was the, the chief priest there in the synagogue. So she was, would have, you know, could have done a whole lot of things at this point, but she was a righteous woman and saw that, that, that this woman, that her, her younger cousin had had a profound experience. And she only knew that because she was full of the Holy Spirit at that time, that she had already moved in that and moved toward the Father in that way. And, and the Holy Spirit, she was open to being able to receive that because she was already in tune to her father. Now in, in application, by saying that you're a spirit filled woman, I'm not talking about that being filled with the Holy Spirit's spirit um, the, in the sense of when we are experience salvation. And I'm also not referring to that continual filling of the Holy Spirit that we have, because as D.L. Moody one time said, we all leak. <laughs> we do, we leak. Our Holy Spirit leaks out because of the way we behave. And so we are continually filled with the Holy Spirit as a believer. It's not that that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is, is a woman who's filled with the, the Holy Spirit in the sense that she knows her tank needs to be refilled, that she is continually moving in the Spirit and is continually seeking out what that looks like so that she can be in tune to what the Father says. It is, um, you know, asking God for wisdom is the same as asking Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. When I'm speaking to a woman, whether I'm counseling her or mentoring her or whatever, while she's speaking, I am always asking the Lord, Lord, help me here. Help me to be able to hear you so that I can give your wisdom. That is asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit right then, to have the Holy Spirit speak to you. You have to be willing to want it, to ask for it, to be, to be attuned to receiving it. That's a woman who is a Spirit-filled woman, a woman who recognizes she needs that continuing filling, and she is willing to ask for that. And, that, and Elizabeth, obviously, was a great example of that. The second characteristic that, Will, that Elizabeth had was that she confirmed God's word. Now, what I want you to look at here and, and notice that in, when Gabriel talks to Mary, he's saying in Luke chapter 1, verses 36 through 37, and this is when he's telling Mary what's about to happen. He says, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. So Elizabeth was actually the living embodiment of a God who was still in the business of doing miracles. She was, she was the embodiment of that. So his having already done so in her life was, was enabled her to be gracious enough to understand the Lord was still doing that in the life of Mary. So ab absolutely being able to understand that God is in the business of doing miracles, that he is in the business of what he is, and being an embodiment of that in your life. So the, again, the application here, because what Elizabeth recognized was this was all God. She was pregnant because she was barren and old. She was pregnant because of God. And she also understood Mary, who was a virgin, was pregnant because of God. She was willing to see all that. Now in application, and, and I wanna take this back a bit to our humanity, again, giving advice, being the one sole person that someone's gonna to come to for advice and counsel, that's a slippery slope. Because what I'm always aware of, and I'm so conscious of, because I'm an opinionated woman, most of us women are. When a woman comes to me and I'm mentoring her, she comes to me for counsel, it's a slippery slope to not give them Deb. You know what I mean? Not to, not to give them what Deb thinks. So that's why while they're speaking, I am in prayer. Lord, tell me what to say. Tell me what you want, what wisdom you want to give them. Get me out of the way. And I'm actively praying in my head the whole time not because I'm so great or anything, it's because I'm not so great that <laughs> I do that because I don't want Deb in the way. 
It is being the understanding that every word uttered by the mentor has to be perfectly aligned with God's word, perfectly aligned and then being the embodiment of God's word because you are willing to then just utter that. You've got to understand you've got to be out of the way. And, um, and it's, it's you know, hard to do that sometimes. You've, and you've got to be willing to just let the Lord fill you in that. The third characteristic I see of Elizabeth is that she was a giver of blessing. So when Elizabeth exclaimed that the baby, the baby in her womb leaped for joy when Mary told her that, she was overwhelmed with gratitude and, and a very beautiful humility because she could have doubted Mary right then. But what she did right then, instead she was so far removed from any human concerns that instead she was overcome with joy by what Mary had told her. So Luke records her saying in chapter 1, verse 42 through 45 of the book of Luke, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she. So what, what Elizabeth did right now, the first thing that she could do is praise. And then she starts blessing the Lord and blessing Mary. The only thing that she wanted to do right then had nothing to do with her. She was just about, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And blessed are you for being the woman who carries this. It is this kind of humility, this kind of God-centeredness, I think, that made Elizabeth the perfect example of a person who can mentor. So again, the application is it, is, it can be a heady thing to have someone looking to you for advice because you can sometimes feel like, okay, you know, I, she's going to do whatever I tell her or, you know, my words are the ones that she clings to. But instead of, instead moving that away from you and onto her and being the one who's willing to bless with God's words and be a blessing to that person. It's, you know, it's Elizabeth never once said a word that lifted herself up. She only moved and spoke about God and she spoke about Mary being blessed. A, a mentor has to be a person that doesn't center on self. It's not about what you go through. It's not about who you are. It's not about what you can do. It is truly about blessing this person in front of you. That doesn't mean you don't share, you know, what's going on to use as an example in your own life. That's, a, that's necessary. But what it does mean is that you're not so focused on you that you have gotten not focused on the person. It is about this girl. It's about this woman who's come to you. And it's about how you can show her God. And then you're out of the picture. You know, James talks about that over and over again in the book of James, about us being out of the way, all being about God. And that's who Elizabeth was, and that's who a mentor needs to be. The fourth characteristic that I see is that she was a woman who cared. You know, um, and this part of her characteristic, her character might be uh, look, looked aside if we're not careful and unnoticed. In Luke chapter 1, verse 56, Luke simply records, and Mary remained with her, remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home. Now, I need you to think about that. Elizabeth is old. And so she's there for three more months. Elizabeth had been pregnant for, you know, three months. And then Mary's with her for three more months. So she's now like six months pregnant and, and she's older. So this is not easy, uh, what she's going through. But she puts that aside and cares for Mary instead. This is a woman who was in it for the long haul. She was in it to help Mary. And then it says that Mary actually left, you know, and it wasn't there for the, for the pregnancy. So Elizabeth didn't keep her there to help her. Elizabeth had her there to help Mary. I mean, that's beautiful. She was a woman who cared. And the application here is that if you're a mentor and you're, and you're guiding a young Christian woman, it's not easy. It, it's going to take a lot of your time. It's going to take a lot of your attention. And, and you've got to be willing to invest in that person for the long haul, just like Elizabeth did. It's not just a one time. It's not just a two times. This is a woman who might be calling you in the middle of the night. This is a woman who needs you and needs you to become alongside of her. That's, that means you've got to be willing to give of yourself. Again, not about you. This is about a, you pouring into another person on behalf of the Father. And finally, the very last characteristic, again, I think is so important, that Elizabeth was first and foremost a loyal wife. Look at how she was with her husband. You know, he was, when Zechariah, and he was the priest, when he went in there into the, into the temple to pray, and he questioned the, the, the angel about whether or not his wife was going to get pregnant, he was struck dumb, wasn't able to speak until the baby was born. But he was told he was going to have to name that baby John. 
Now, Elizabeth could have, when the baby was born, could have said stuff like, you know what, this name is not in our family. You haven't even been talking for the last few months. You do whatever, you, do, you don't have anything to say about this. We need to stay in the family name. Because all the other people in the village were pressuring them and saying, well, John's not even somebody you call somebody from your, that's not in your lineage, no name there. But instead of questioning her husband, instead of questioning anything at all, she was loyal to her husband. She said in Luke chapter one, verse 60, no, he shall be called John. So she immediately, immediately aligns herself with her husband, Zechariah. Now, I think that's an important characteristic because of this. You can't help somebody else if your own house isn't in order. How in the world am I going to mentor someone else on their marriage if I don't have my own marriage in order? How in the world am I going to mentor someone on child raising if I don't have my own children, if I haven't raised my own children appropriately, or I don't have that in order? How can I talk to someone about godly living if I don't exemplify godly living in my own life? It, to put it short, you have to have your own house clean before you can start trying to clean somebody else's. It is a it, being loyal to your own family, to your own life, understanding that you have to exemplify that which you are mentoring. That's that's very important. And so many. It, it, and if you haven't, if that's why you have women who need to be mentored and women who are in a position to mentor. You're not in a position to mentor if you haven't already been through these things. That's what puts you in the position to mentor. If you're still in the midst of it, then sisters, you need a mentor. So that's, and that's the, that's the necessary order here. So that's why it often is older women who are mentoring younger women, because we've already experienced those things. It doesn't have to be that, but generally that's what it is. Younger women are right in the throes of those things. So once they get through them successfully, then they can do that. Having your own house in order first, and then you can bring that wisdom that the Lord gives you. Now you'll see these five characteristics do not require you to have a doctorate or have you a seminary degree or make you be able to recite the Bible or be able to recite verses. This is all about, it really is almost always about your relationship with God, your relationship in terms of who you are and who he is, and whether or not you're willing to be unselfish with your time and unselfish with your, your own knowledge and selfish with who you are and giving it to someone else. And understand, this is one of those areas where God has been very clear in his Bible, in, in his word, that the older women are to do this for the younger women. He, he, that's, that's said in 1 Timothy. That's said in Titus 2. This is what we're supposed to do. Paul clearly says this. So because, you know, God he gives us a lot of direct mandates, and this is one of them, that this is something we should do. So in terms of that, I'm praying that if you have already done these things, you've already lived through these things, and that you would see in yourself this willingness, and if you are spirit-filled, if you understand what it means to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a woman of prayer, if you're humble, if you don't mind giving of your time in this way, if you're the embodiment of all that God has done in your life and all the miracles that he's wrought, then be willing to share that with someone else. Again, this is, a, this is the study of, this one's about Elizabeth and being a mentor. As I've always do at the end of that chapter, I give you necessary steps that you can go through if you see these characteristics in yourself, you can get the book at debwaterbury.com or at Amazon, Six Pairs of Sandals. Make sure you subscribe so you'll know when our next episode comes up. I pray that God has moved in your heart and that through these last three at least, that you're ready to start seeing that maybe you should be stepping out of ministry. We do have two more, so looking forward to talking to you about those. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. I hope you were blessed, and I hope you got some information that's going to help you get through your day. If you want any more information on any of my books or my articles or on any of my future speaking engagements, you can find all that information at debwaterbury.com. God bless you.